Hello, everybody, and I can see there are a whole lot more people dropping in. Welcome to today's Anat Micro Talk. And today we're going to be hosting our guests from the 2023 ANAP Synapse Residency Program and also the ANAP Bespoke Program. My name is Melissa Delaney and I am the CEO of ANAP, the Australian Network for Art and Technology. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a woman with blonde hair and I'm wearing a black jacket. And I'm coming to you today from Ghana country in South Australia in Adelaide. So again, welcome. It's great to have you here in this lunchtime bite size um, talk with some incredible speakers. So with just a bit of housekeeping, we are recording this. And so we're asking everybody to keep their, their screens on mute and you're welcome to have your, your video screens going. We'll be introducing the speakers soon. And we have Jen Brazier behind the scenes, Anat's program manager. Michelle Wig is our technical person today. And Oshaf with us so, who is Anat's arts administrator, are all working behind the scenes. Feel free to use the chat and you can drop in and say hello to each other. And also let us know where you are today and where you're you're zooming in from. So I'm going to go around the table and briefly introduce everybody and then they can talk more about themselves and then we'll go into the conversation um, segment of the session. So today in the room from Anat Synapse 2023, we have Alicia Sometimes and her collaborator, Tamara Davis um, from Queensland. And then we also have joining us from another Synapse residency, Ross Manning and distinguished professor um, in the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at QUT, Lydia Morasco. We have also Dr. Anna Tweedale attached to that project. And um, also our ANAT bespoke people this year from Swinburne University, Professor Christopher Fluke and Dr. Peter Morse, the artist collaborator on that project. So I'm going to hand over to Alicia and Alicia, if you could please introduce yourself and then hand to um, Tamara, that would be amazing. Yes. So, yeah, my name's Alicia Sometimes. I'm she, her, and I'm on the land of the Boon Wurrung people of the East Kulin Nation. And I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and note that they were the first artists and scientists on this land. I have black hair and a permanent fringe and the Hubble telescope on my neck. Um, I've been so excited to do this residency with Professor Tamara Davis and team at the University of Queensland in the School of Mathematics and Physics. And I've been, uh, the title of the uh, residency has been Astropoetic Compositions, Mapping Dark Energy Through Poetic Experimentation. And that's very ambitious because scientists don't quite know exactly uh, what dark energy is, um, but we're looking at contextualization of language, um, also uh, language within a scientific framework, a poetic framework, storytelling and visualization and sonification of language. Um, and it's been this great mix of doing it online and um, being very lucky to go up to Queensland and talk to Tamara and her extraordinary team. And what is becoming really evident is uh, the fact that the the language surrounding science is, you know, uh, so full of variety, breadth and uh, interest. But th I think that scientists are in some ways born storytellers because everything uh, is spoken about in metaphor and meaning and so forth. So it's been a really rich experience talking to these scientists, seeing the way that they think of things and um, just looking at and, and taking notes like, uh, uh, you know, someone 
on a on a mission uh, looking at the way language is used throughout uh, poetics, uh, throughout science in a poetic way, and also the fact that language can mean so many things. So that's me for now. And Tamara, Professor Tamara Davis. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm um, a professor of astrophysics. I'm at the University of Queensland on Turbul and Yagara land and also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I am a she, her. I have brown hair, slightly graying and a little bit too many age spots thanks to a bit of a uh, too many beach days as a youngster, um, but still enjoying uh, all of that. Um, I've We've had a fantastic residency so far. Um, I think one of the highlights for me was Alicia getting the, a couple of dozen astrophysicists to write poetry. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, really amazing the kinds of poems that people came up with. And the I knew it would be interesting to um, have this um, happening. Um, and it's been a, a long time sort of, um, sort of understanding of mine that we need to be able to communicate better our our science and also look at the the meaning and, and things behind uh the the equations that we get to play with but yeah i've been actually um, blown away by just how engaged the group has been with uh alicia's visit and how everybody's just really gotten into it and so many different conversations going on uh, in the hallways and things so it's been absolutely fantastic so far we can't hear you melissa Thank you. Um, and people can go to Alicia's Creative Research Journal on the ANAT website to read more about the, the poetry and astrophysics. I'm going to hand over to Ross now. So, Ross, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, my name's Ross. Uh, I'm living and working on yoga and Turable land in Mianjin, Brisbane. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I have uh, brown hair, um, glasses, big eyebrows, and a khaki button-up shirt. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been also I've been working with uh, Anna and Lydia um, in a project called Aerosol, uh, where we've been uh, kind of creatively exploring how you know, art might uh, change the way we think about living in and interacting with uh, building and their indoor atmospheres, um, you know, producing kind of DIY blue sky experimental works. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're sort of still going. We've got a couple of months uh, left. So we're at the pointy end of uh, the residency. We're actually kind of getting into a a really nice new workshop um, at QUT um, and getting, you know, getting hands on and um, making some prototypes up until December. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Anna Tweedell. Anna, if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much, um, Melissa. My name's Anna Tweedale and I'm also joining from Yugara and Turbul country at, um, and I'm a lecturer in architecture at QUT. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a woman with long brown hair wearing a, a black dress with a colourful pattern on it. Um, and so I'm trained as an architect, but I've spent over 20 years also collaborating with artists at the intersection between architecture and art. Um, I'm also a registered practicing architect. So come with um, that sort of um, practice experience of designing buildings and environments for people to live in. And, um, and obviously also a researcher and educator. So um, I'm really excited at this opportunity to work again with Ross. I have collaborated with Ross in the past. And um, so it's great to sort of revisit now after a number of years where Ross's practice has just developed and matured so much. And it's really great to sort of reconnect in working together. And I'm also very excited to have this opportunity to work with um, Professor Lydia Moravska um, and her work and Perhaps I, that's an opportunity to hand over to Lydia also. Thank you, Anna. 
Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Uh, my name is Lydia Moraska. I'm a professor at uh, Queensland University of Technology, uh, she, her. I'm speaking also from um, Turba and Yugoland. Um, I'm a physicist uh, working in a broad area of air quality and its impact on the environment of uh, human health. Um, and uh, solutions to solving the problems of air pollution. Of course, being a physicist, it may appear so far away from any art, but I always had a very soft spot for art, and I've been always very interested in art, why I can't create art as such. But uh, merging physics and air quality with art is an amazing opportunity. And I must say that last year, when uh, we had here in Brisbane, uh, the exhibition in the GOMA, um, Gallery of Modern Art, Air, I contributed to uh, and worked with the people organizing this exhibition. The, a specific challenge of this, so air quality aerosol, aerosols are particles in the air. Under normal circumstances, we don't see them. And this is how to turn um, invisible visible. I mean, under normal circumstances, unless pollution is really, really bad. But pollution can, can be quite severe and we still can't see. So how to turn um, invisible visible. So that's that amazing challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing your wealth of knowledge to this project and to the room today. I'll hand over to Peter Morse now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> good to be here. Um, I'm Peter Morse. I'm in uh, Lutruwita, Tasmania. Um, he, him. Uh, I am, I guess, a middle-aged bloke with dark hair and wearing black. Very simple. <laughs> That's it. Um, I had a bespoke residency uh, with Chris Fluke, Professor Cliff Chris Fluke at Swinburne University um, SmartSat CRC, which is based in the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing. I'm fortunate to have known Chris for 20 years, 20 odd years. Uh, we were friends sort of back in Melbourne days when I used to work at the Victorian College of the Arts. I have a, a, a strange mixed background. I have a, a fine arts sort of background before I moved into sort of media arts. I have a couple of PhDs, one in semiotics, art history, and another in uh, computational geophysics um, and data visualization. Um, and I've had a sort of, I guess, an ongoing interest in landscape and earth observation and more sort of hobby things like astrophysics and so on. So I'm interested to see Tamara here and, and, the, and the, the dark energy stuff. I made a, a full day movie about dark matter with Alan Duffy, who's at Swinburne as well. Um, and working with Chris, what we focused on was looking at how we can sort of optimize or create new ways of interrogating Earth observation data, bringing it to uh, sort of local devices, mobile devices using computer game engines. So the idea is to to uh, sort of contact, establish a communication pattern, I guess, between what's occurring with satellite observation of, of, of the Earth, how that data is streamed down, how it can be processed, specifically with a lot of interest in using artificial intelligence because you were dealing with prodigious amounts of data. How can that be summarized and interact with users situated in a landscape who may have specialist knowledge about the landscape? So you can see obvious applications for things like in, in cities or farmers or doing bushfire monitoring and things like that. So we were looking at really developing uh, design patterns and technologies for establishing those connections and kind of gamifying it to a degree. Yeah. Yes. Um, I enjoyed very much your creative research journal and reading those collaborations of sorts that yourself and Chris were doing with AI in the early days of your project when you discovered that um, AI and ChatGPT and other platforms soon became um, a key collaborator in the work that you were doing. I'll hand over to you, Chris, and you can introduce yourself, Professor Christopher Flew. Thanks, Melissa, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so I am an academic at Swinburne University of Technology. I usually uh, live and work on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, but today I'm on Ghana country, uh, just down the road or up the road. I'm not sure which direction it is from um, Annette uh, head office. Um, my pronouns are he, him, 
Uh, I am an increasingly middle-aged uh, man with a hair that is getting grayer and grayer. Um, I'm wearing a shirt that I'm going to set you a challenge. It's either a red shirt with white checks or a white shirt with red checks. Um, so um, you can you can determine that for yourself. Um, I hold the position of uh, a professor or chair with the SmartSat Cooperative Research Center, um, which has uh, taken me on quite a fascinating journey from my background in astrophysics and data visualization to applications in earth observation and other space related fields. I have a very long uh, connection with ANAT uh, over about 20 years of working with a variety of different artists through the uh, incredible Synapse program uh, and have just finished six years uh, as a member of the ANAT board. Thank you. And while you're here in the room, Chris, I think that we will We'll direct the first question to your project with Peter. So you have had a long association. You've done Synapse programs before with artists. You've collaborated with artists for a really long time. So I'd like to hear more today about this specific bespoke project that you've done with somebody else that you've known for a really long time. But what were some of the, the new discoveries and learnings from this project that you've been doing this year with, with Peter? Well, I might start and then hand hand quickly to Peter just to to say that you know when when an opportunity came up to work with Peter, uh, I jumped at it. It's, you know this was sort of you know, the um, a, a, a dream opportunity. I think what I've learnt working with artists over many years is how we're interested in very similar problems, and we have some uh, approaches that are quite compatible, but we also have some very different reasons why we try and reach a solution. And, and, and for me, I think that was really summed up in the, um, the name that we gave to this project of Playable Earth. Um, not only were we looking for a way to bring Earth observation into modern gaming engines, which allows us then to much more easily um, get um, uh, visualizations into augmented or virtual reality, but I think it's also a good metaphor for what Peter and I did, which we just played with ideas constantly. Um, uh, and, and I think that was sort of the really um, important part of this process was setting Peter challenges that should have been impossible to solve and he solved them far too quickly, uh, which then pushed the uh, pressure back on me to find out the next really difficult thing for him to do. So I might, I might um, pass over to Peter to talk a little bit about some of the specifics of uh, what we did together. Great, thank you. Okay, um, well, you can see a pretty detailed outline of the sort of stuff that we covered in, in the ANAC blog. I got quite, you know, literarily enthused <laughs> during the writing of this because there was so much interesting new material. I think the key thing that emerged, uh, because this uh, started, Chris, it was it was the middle of last year, wasn't it, or that, that we commenced? Um, so we spent about six months working together. And, and of course, the major revolution that occurred during that time was ChatGPT and the emergence of, of these large language models and the way that they can summarize model uh, information, uh, massive amounts of data. Um, and so that became an object of huge interest to me. And, and I've since moved on uh, from working, you know, with with the, the chat GPT and Unreal Engine with a whole series of other sort of generative uh, models which have come out, uh, which are uh, sort of offer more programmatic opportunities than working with chat GPT. The thing that I discovered there was that they really augment one's activity. I think of them not so much as artificial intelligence as intelligence augmentation devices. So they were really super helpful in terms of assisting with developing programming techniques, working with Python and Google Colabs and accessing uh, what are typically obscure data formats which you come across in earth observations such as hdf5 and you know cdf or you know there's a there's a, a, a myriad specific file formats that one would need to query and modify to translate into a form that's amenable to use with a computer game engine or a mobile device for instance so there's a whole set of technical pipelines that, that one would need to resolve and so um we spent a lot of time uh, looking at that. Uh, it's really looking at how we can bring what's essentially a, a sort of platform like Unreal Engine, a game engine, which is part of the media industry and its cognate sort of formats, 
with these sort of scientific formats, which are developed for very specific types of query and representation of, of data in particular ways. And then you've got to develop pipelines and interfaces that enable users to query that data and interact with that data in hopefully revelatory and interesting ways. And so that was, you know, really the ongoing discussion that Chris and I had about how we can construct that, how we can uh, connect mobile devices with supercomputers such as they have at Swinburne or repositories and GPU farms and things like that. And you've got a whole lot of technical constraints about the fact that you can't run high-end graphics on a little crappy mobile device, even if it's an iPhone 15, there's a big difference in the GPU there and what you would have on your desktop gaming computer, for instance. So we're looking at developing cloud services for extended reality. And then it, it's really this, you become a kind of a munger of complicated pipelines of data from satellite cloud repositories into streaming XR, that sort of infrastructure to delivery over 5G uh, Wi-Fi networks down to the sort of interaction and interfaces one can design uh, for a mobile device. So that hopefully encapsulates. Yeah, thank you. That's incredible work. And this is part of the, the multidisciplinary um, success stories, I think, that, that Anat's able to platform and bring those different mindsets together and those explorations and that experimental space has been something that's been an incredible thing. Your bespoke project is has been longer than the traditional synapse model in that you've had the the privilege of starting it last year and then coming into the to the mid of this year as well. So yours was extended a little bit more. Ross, I'm handing over to you. We're interested in hearing some of the the ways that you've worked with your collaborators. Um, you've got three people involved in your project and with really different fields of research and practice. Thank you. Yes, I feel very privileged to be working with such a big team who are doing real uh, trailblazing work uh, in this space. The first thing was how enormous aerosol science is um, and just getting up to speed with all the different um, uh, avenues that, they, that the research is going down. Um, the human building interaction group uh, was amazing. They had all sorts of different tangents um, about uh, indoor air quality and health and architecture. Um, and of course, um, Lydia was doing some amazing work as well. Um, so it was sort of just at the start, a big uh, kind of learning curve, education about what it is. Um, and then we wanted to uh, kind of narrow it down uh, to just indoor air quality was where we landed. Um, and um, basically, we after uh, we were looking at some, um, some different uh, sort of themed topics that then we could um, expand upon. So we were looking at air filtration, um, ventilation, and uh, sanitation of the air, um, uh, indoor in, the air and indoor environments. And, you know, because air is sort of uh, at once kind of personal because it's inside your body, but then also public. Um, and you're always sharing um, kind of uh, molecules with your environment. You know, you're breathing in uh, the fumes from your carpet, as well as um, from pathogens from other people. So kind of, um, as Lydia said, sort of making this invisible world visible was one of the um, sort of launch launching points for this in, uh, kind of, um, you know, research. But I was, I was taking it kind of all quite poetically um, and uh, not really doing anything too academic, but but more sort of in like a poetic kind of um, abstracted um, way of thinking. Um, awareness was another thing that we wanted to, to look at, which was, um, you know, how many people are in the room um, and uh, kind of the exchanges of, of aerosols between them. Um, so, yeah, so we started uh, initially, I got, I got really interested in UV light. Um, light's a big part of my practice. So 
Um, and, you know, the kind of UV sanitizers you see, the little ones or the, the UV light uh, in hand dryers and those kind of things kind of interested me, uh, you know, the power of, of that ultraviolet electromagnetic spectrum was it was super interesting like that a uh, color you know it can be a color but it, it's also uh germicidal you know like it actually can break down dna and rna give you cancer uh, and those kinds so it's kind of dangerous but it's a it's sort of a beautiful color as well so i was uh, working um with some prototypes um around uv light where um, well, there's a bunch of them, but we were thinking of having, well, I've tried a few different types. We're using black light because um, it's a little safer. It's a little higher in the spectrum, um, around the 200, uh, 222 um, uh, um, kind of wavelength of light. Um, so it, I was using black light, but uh, making sort of sculptures, uh, kinetic sculptures that inhale the air kept it in a chamber for a while with the circulate with circuit circular around UV light and then exhale as well. So thinking about kind of breathable sculptures or like a building that can breathe um, and also sanitize um, the air at the same time. Mm. Yeah. So we kind of uh, I built a bunch of different prototypes looking at that. Um, the next one we're looking at is uh, kind of an awareness model where it's, um, you know, you'd have cameras or something that could gauge how many people are in the space and have different uh, lights or um, artwork components that would start moving and the more and more people that entered the space, mm. uh, you know, it would be more active, just that kind of awareness thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so there's a few other... Um, it's probably three or four more prototypes or kind of chapters of prototyping that we'd like to uh, look at. And I'm sure that um, on a personal level, you are starting to look at the world differently through this this um, this focus on the invisible world and now how you interact with the physical world around you with this growing knowledge and experience that you've had working with Anna and Lydia. And I'd like to hear how working with Ross and this project has changed the way that you look at your work. For me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think in some ways we're, as Ross said, we're still in an early days of this process and we're really ramping up to looking at more of that making um, going into the last couple of months of it. And as I said, I'd also uh, collaborated with Ross previously. So in a way, I'm probably also um, responding a bit to that previous collaboration. So for me, um, you know, Ross works through um, uh, material and experimentation and setting up, uh, setting up scenarios or situations that then... Um, allow experiential phenomena to kind of unfold or emerge whether that is in, in light or sound or or kind of interactive um, interactive situations not just interaction with people but interactions between um, between material elements or mechanical elements um, etc and I'm really excited um, I think, you know, going forward, it's it's going to be, as Ross was saying, a sort of process of this um, prototyping and then also then discussion. So I think the, the idea is that Ross might set up some, um, we, well, we want to set up a workshop with some of the other members of the Human Building Interaction group and maybe, uh, and Lydia and her group, if they're available to come as well and just kind of like do some making with people and and show them what we've been making. Um, and so I think into, I, I'm looking forward to that and what I also take away from learning that um, for all of my collaborations, um, I, I learn so much from working with different artists and different disciplines. I think the, the sort of boundaries between ways of knowing and doing things when you're looking at sort of a, a similar phenomena or a similar interest 
but understanding them from the slightly different perspectives is just really um, often revelatory and makes you think so differently about what you're doing. Yes, absolutely. And the collaboration is um, key here. We've, we talked to people who at the beginning of Synapse and shift them away at that stage as at the beginnings of not having any preconceived conceptions of, of how this is going to work because in the, the sense of a pure collaboration, each of you bring your own skill set and experience and, and backgrounds to that. And to have any preconceived ideas at the beginning then defaults that collaboration because we're really interested in that experimental space and what you each bring. Um, Lydia, I'd like to hear about your experience working with the artists and um, the other teams on this project. Uh, well, two aspects of this. One is uh, actually something which uh, Ross uh, mentioned, that UV light, something which made me realise how different it could be uh, having something which is uh, visually uh, attractive that creates good art and whether this is a good representation of science. So um, this conversation about UV uh, light, I remember when uh, we uh, we talked about this uh, with Ross, was also very attracted to that idea and had some sort of thoughts what he was going to do with this. But then when we discussed this and I explained the issue with UV radiation, uh, particularly with the system being used currently, which are usually the upper room because of the dangers of interacting directly with uh, skins. So, um, so that's not something which we can take lightly. So that's that far UV, which uh, Ross mentioned, uh, um, UV uh, 222, uh, it's safer. On the other hand, it has a potential to create so-called secondary pollutants. So there's also a balance uh, in this. So that's something which we'll have to keep in mind. There's another aspect of this. This is radiation. So while artistically to an artist, this sounds interesting, but to many people, just ordinary people, it would sound dangerous, it's radiation. So, uh, so how to bring this all aspects together that it's scientifically correct, that it's visually interesting, and that it gives the right image of that, what it does and for what purpose. So that's one, uh, that's, that's something which will make, make me much more aware of this. Another aspect which I'm really looking forward to is uh, something which Ross also mentioned, awareness. The problem with awareness is such that people in general are not aware of the of air pollution, as I said, unless it is so bad that you can't see, then there's a problem. But not under normal circumstances, even if the pollution is quite high, people don't pay attention, and even less indoor, indoors. Indoor air pollution doesn't doesn't exist. Doesn't people bring sources like sometimes I come to a room and there's ocean of candles. Well, this is you you and that often happens in Scandinavian countries where they put so much effort in cleaning the air and then there's that ocean of candles and bringing pollutants to the air. So this is that awareness of indoor air basically doesn't exist at all. The pandemic slightly brought it into the picture, but I think it's fading. So bringing this awareness, it's something very important. How to do it? I remember once when I was in my big frustration when I was uh, writing an article for, for the conversation and trying to somehow, as I, was, I was, and I wrote this and then they put it in, in a visual, just imagine that if what I'm exhaling is, is a pink, so it's, a, it's not invisible, but a pink plume is coming from my mouth and that pink plume is tumbling down and that pink plume is eventually swallowing you and that in pink, this pink plume, you have green beads and these green beads are pathogens. So now they are coming towards you. So that, that was my image. Then they, they put it then as say visual in, in uh, the conversation online. But this is what my idea, what, really, what is what really speaks to people, how to build a real awareness through art in that area of indoor air. That's something I'm really looking forward to. Well, what Ross will come up with. Yes, I think we all are. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Alicia to come to the room now and talk about your project, Alicia. I know you've just come off the back end of 
conducting some workshops with astrophysicists in poetry in Queensland. So Alicia sometimes. Thanks. It's so inspiring hearing what everyone else is doing. And for me and uh, with this project, it's really just scratching the surface. We're just starting and I feel like I'm a magpie and everything that Tamara and her team are talking about, I'm just hoarding the, the, these little bits of information. And the trouble, I guess, or, or, or maybe um, something to consider with poetry is that it can be very abstract. So astrophysics is just this incredible, just a, such an, a broad umbrella of so many things and to have abstraction on top of um, some things that are already abstract is something that I'm, uh, you know, uh, contending with and that's quite interesting. Um, so many stories in astrophysics, you know, it's about coordinates, velocities, relationships, uh, you know, distance, mapping, data. These stories are amazing. And of course, uh, when you think of something about, you know, dark energy, something that you can't see, why does the acceleration of the universe matter? And um, the the every the stories that go along with that. I um, I'm glad Ross talks about awareness as well because. Uh, so many stories I'm just falling in love with. And at the moment, that is um, so interesting to talk to one scientist about one particular thing that they're studying. It might be spheres. And then another one's talking about peculiar velocities or something like that. And then it's like, oh, and I'm just like a, a kid in a candy store. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's just so amazing. So uh, astrophysics is so broad and uh, in Tamara's team, even looking at some of the same things, they're, they're focusing on really individual things. So this sort of threading of narrative and storytelling and contextualizing the science and also just looking at the uh, linear and nonlinear threads and how uh, I'm especially listening as well and recording. And so I'm, I'm working out ways of, you know, we, of course, trying to make the unseen seen, but the unseen heard as well. So talking and listening. So I'm in that really deep sort of phase of listening. And I really hope also um, in the coming months to give back to Tamara as well and sort of have, uh, you know, more to and fro. Because at the moment, I'm just sort of gobbling up all the space of um, listening to these fascinating stories. And at not at one point am I bored. And I, I, it is probably looking at where I'm focusing on and um, look, but the language is just so uh, it's apparent that these um, moments and points of language are really fascinating and I can't wait to create with it. I just can't wait. Thank you so much. And it is around language and different languages and creating new languages. Um, and I'm always fascinated by the synapse residencies um, for that aspect as well. So thank you so much for deep diving, diving and also the listening project. Tamara, um, I'd like to hear, and I'm sure everybody else would like to hear from your, you about your experience working with Alicia. Yeah, thanks. It's been a really great experience so far. As I said, my group's gotten super engaged and excited about uh, uh, doing things with in the sort of artistic space. Um, and it's really clear that the the techniques that are used by Alicia and us are in many ways the same. We spend a lot of time observing uh, and then we try to take that and create something from it. In our case, it's new knowledge about astrophysics, about the world, about how the universe began, how, what's happening, what the laws of physics are, how's the universe going to end. You know, we, the whole, I think it's underappreciated just how creative uh, science is um, in general and how it's not like sitting there just calculating equations that you were taught in high school or something like that. You're trying to ask questions that no one's thought to ask before and look at the universe from perspectives that no one has seen before uh, and then come up with new knowledge, understand it in a different way and share that with the world. And then, of course, hope that the world sees your contributions as valuable. Um, and uh, as was just as was mentioned, it's the kinds of things we're doing are quite abstract. Well, I'm trying to understand dark energy and dark matter, literally things that we we can't see. Um, so, but we can tell they're there by their 
um, effect on other aspects. So we, we were um, looking at maps, the kind of maps that we've made, for example, a team that I'm working with called the Dark Energy Survey has mapped the positions of over half a billion galaxies. Um, and they cover about an eighth of the sky out to about half the age of the universe ago. So the, the more distant galaxies in that map emitted the light well before the Earth had even formed. They're that far away that it's taken that long for the light to get to us. And so once we're, we're really at the, this point of being able to map the universe in these amazing ways, which is, is the thing that has revealed such bizarre things, like the fact that gravity appears to be pushing, not pulling when you go to those scales. So explaining why is um, really interesting and um, trying to pick the meaning from the equations is some of the things that we're looking at working with together. What an absolute privilege to be um, working with you all on at this moment in time. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to um, do a quick bounce around and ask each of the artists where to next. Um, we've got a, a couple of minutes to touch on that. Alicia, I'll bounce over to you. Where to after this? Well, I'm just hoping to uh, consume and and uh, marinate on all this beautiful information and, uh, yeah, uh, work further with Tamara and her team and, um, yeah, create. I, th that's what I just can't wait. I'm like a little puppy. Can't wait to just start getting this information together. And it is a starting point, isn't it? We get that feedback about synapse all the, all of the time. I know that everyone in this room has work that their practice and research extends beyond synapse, but synapse is a deep dive into giving you that space to be able to experiment. And we understand from Anat's point of view that it really is a starting point. Um, so thank you so much. Ross, where to from after your synapse, where to next for you? Ross may have frozen. I'm going to go to you, Peter Morse. Um, well, okay, so uh, Chris and I have put in, uh, it, it sort of comes down to grant writing, okay? So we, we're not breatharians, us sort of sci-art people. Not um, yet. We need to have some sort of income to survive and do things. So that was why six months working with Chris was fantastic. So I could live in my garret eating cabbages and drinking water and, you know, getting by, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so we put a, an application for a cesium grant. Cesium is a sort of like an equivalent to uh, Google Earth, basically, but it's open source and you can plug it into Unreal Engine. Um, and then I'm developing sort of workflows and methodologies really on my own, off my own bat now, um, sort of working with AI systems and looking at what we can do with with AI technologies, because you can run a lot of stuff locally. And you can generate data sets upon which to train highly specific sort of AI systems. And there's a lot of emergent cloud services, which are either free or affordable or open source or whatever. So those sorts of things are the activities that I'm looking at at the moment. And then if we get uh, some, hopefully, fingers crossed, Chris, if we get our cesium grant or if, you know, at least be in a position to look for, for other funding through other resources, then we can look at developing something that has actual utility. And I think that's that's the other thing that emerges from the ANAT sort of project is how can, uh, you know, art is not necessarily just an abstract aesthetic kind of process, but in its interaction with scientific knowledge and discourse, it can actually exhibit great utility. So what we want to do is look at how we can uh, develop a system that enables us to interrogate satellite data in a comprehensive comprehensible kind of and, and utilitarian way that breaks it out of the specifically the remit of things like GIS systems, which would be desktop uh, applications which are used by certain sort of specialisms. It's not to dispute the, the, the importance of those sorts of systems, but just to say, well, how can we think outside that set of conventional parameters of, of uh, looking at this type of data and how can we develop new sorts of discourses and queries about the data and interactions amongst different audiences for that data. So those are the sorts of things that I think we're uh, working towards. Chris, you might have thoughts about that. No, I think I agree with everything you said. I think that um, the the challenge, the synapse is a, is a catalyst 
um and then it's now you know we don't want to just walk away from these great projects so it, it's on us as the um the the research is often to, to now go right what are we going to do to, to make sure that this this project can continue so yeah we're working working really hard to make that a reality so i want to keep working with peter for as long as i can thank you uh ross are you in the room no well, I think there should be an artist at every table. I'd like to see artists in corporations. I'd like to see artists in research facilities. I'd like to see artists as um, as part of brains trusts and think tanks. I think that would bring incredible um, discussions and also experimental interrogations into lots of different sectors. Speaking of synapse, the synapse applications are open for the 2024 program and people have until the 16th of November to apply for that. I think Jen is dropping some more information in the chat box around that. Synapse is in its 20th year next year, so it's going to be a big year for us. And we've got some exciting um, announcements to make around that later next year. For some of the people in the audience, I'm encouraging you to subscribe to Anna Digest and there's a link in the chat box where you can um, subscribe to the Digest, which is a monthly e-newsletter, which has loads of Anna news and also national and international opportunities within arts, science and technology areas. So I want to once again thank everyone and all of the speakers that came along today for your time and your generosity and for the incredible work that you've all been doing. And also thank you all in the audience who dropped in during this lunchtime to also listen to our speakers today. Thank you very much. And we will close off now and see you next time. <laughs>